Good morning everyone. I am Dr. Gyanandan Tripathi, an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Climate Science Department in Aysar Pune. Uh, so, this Department of Earth and Climate Science has a diverse uh, interest. So, basically we have geophysicists, geochemists, geologists and climate modeling. And the, the main focus of this department is to understand monsoon, monsoon dynamics, you know, prediction and understanding earthquake processes, understanding fossils and their interaction, how the biological things change over climate. And also there is a paleoclimate group who study the isotopes of speleotherms or tree rings to understand monsoon variability. I myself is a geochemist as I mentioned. So basically I use chemistry to understand geological processes. My research mainly focuses on uh, land surface process and uh, long term carbon cycling. I am a trained physicist, my master was in physics with a specialization of solid state physics. Then while doing I, my PhD I got into the geochemistry uh, expertise. So I shall be talking today about one of my interests which is about mountains, rivers and CO2. So that is what I will be talking today. It will link three important geological processes. If you see mountain, it is about representing tectonics and rivers is basically talking about erosion process, the weathering, the breakdown of rocks and CO2 is about climate. So today what I will do is I will try to uh, give a glimpse how these three important geological processes are coupled. So with that brief outline I will try to talk take you through about our own solar system and why we are unique. So basically there are two things which makes us very unique. One is the existence of life and water, water in liquid phase and the other part is the active geological activity, right? So the tectonism, the mountain building process also makes us very unique. Basically, if you see the solar system, we are rightly located, located at a distance of one astronomical unit and that is uh, very much allowing us to have water in liquid phase. So if you see a relative scaling, we are just like a sand particle rotating around the sun which is uh, of a orange size and the total distance in that scaling will be around 9 meters. So uh, orange and sand moving within a uh, diameter of 9 meters, that is what we are talking of. But that makes it a very crucial because if you see our neighboring planets, Venus and planet Mars, their atmosphere are mainly composed of CO2. CO2 is the most abundant composition in this atmosphere. But when you look for our own planet, it is the nitrogen or oxygen. So we have very tiny amount of CO2. It is a trace element, uh, trace composed gas and we have typically around 4, uh, 400 ppm V of CO2 in our planet. But that is sufficient enough, mainly so because if you try to understand the heat budget of our planet, the heat budget of our planet basically is controlled by uh, the solar flux. So if you have a solar flux that goes through and there is a solar energy which is incident our planet and there is a heat budget which we talk of there uh, the heat budget, the heat budget is uh, in an optimal balance because if you try to make a mass balance calculation of the energy incident and try to compute the temperature we should have in our planet. So based on only solar energy it should be around minus 18 degree centigrade. But what we see as average temperature of our planet is about 15 degree centigrade. So there is a difference of about 30 degree centigrade that we see what is expected from the solar incident and what you see today. And that 30 degree centigrade difference is very crucial because minus 18 would not have been a very sustainable temperature and the rise of this 30 degree makes us uh, uh, the planet as a having habitable planet. So this 30 degree is uh, mainly the difference comes through the presence of good amount, optimal amount of greenhouse gases in our planet and CO2 is one of the primary things in that. 
All right. So, so what, what we study is that we have a very perfect climate, but that is not the same for other plants. Now, the reason why there is a difference is probably the answer lies in the interior part of our Earth. So, if you see our own planet uh, Earth and its interior part of the planet, if you see the image, uh, people do a lot of geophysical investigation to come up with this model where they do a lot of uh, seismological analysis. There are certain kind of waves that can penetrate through and their reflection or refraction patterns you can study to talk in terms of the interior part, part of our plan. So, these studies have been done extensively. Uh, what I am showing is that the, uh, the things of uh, the interior part of the planet, which is the core, the mantle, and the crust. So, we have three parts. The upper part is crust, of course. The intermediate part is uh, mantle, and the lower part is core. Now, this uh, the mantle part has high heat energy, and that heat energy comes from high amount of radioactive decay of elements that is presenting present within the metal and because of this heat so this uh, liquid kind of uh, if i give you a glimpse of what the situation inside the planet if you try to put a water uh, water container above a stove heat it so basically i put a two wooden block above it so if you heat it they will create convection currents and this convection, because of this convection current, the wood blocks will start moving either towards them, depending on the direction of this convection, or they will go away from each other. A similar kind of process actually happen in the interior part, where the mental you have lot of heat energy and they lead to lot of convection within the magma chamber. And for that reason, the continental blocks which are relatively lighter compared to the mental, they start moving apart. And when they hit each other, they either one of them will go up and you start forming mountains or you can uh, one few of them will go down and subduct and became part of the magma through assimilation process. So, this is the uh, mountain building process that is very crucial to have that optimal temperature or to have that optimal amount of greenhouse gas. Now, how does this mountain building is uh, making the CO2 concentration very optimal? I, I shall be talking in the next few slides. Right. So, this is again the same thing, you might have seen that the mountains are there and there are ocean basins, there is again continental mass. So, if you see the density of these things, the oceanic crust is about 3 gram per cc, which is uh, basalt, mostly basaltic in nature and hence they are heavier, whereas continental crust is about 2.7 gram per cc. And if the two crusts are favorable and they are convergent, means they are coming towards each other, part of it may go down and there will be this uh, oceanic sediments may, you may find some of these oceanic sediments over the mountain and this mount, this ocean basin will be closed and at that place you will find a mountain. So, this is a process through which you build mountains. Now, in the present scenario, we are worried that the CO2 concentration is constantly increasing. And when you talk in terms of long term time scales, the geological time scales, the millennia time scales, what really happens is the conditions were quite different and there has been CO2 concentration which is far more higher than what you see today. Actually, if you are talk, we are concerned that the CO2 concentration today is around 400 ppm. But pre-industrial if you go to 250 ppm, then at some point of the planet Earth it was actually 4000 ppm and they were fluctuating 4000 became to 1000 and why this change is happening, why the CO2 concentration is not measured as like Venus or Mars, why the difference for planet Earth. So, the answer to that lies in a thermostat that our planet has. And this thermostat is uh, what you see is basically the CO2 concentration, which is uh, uh, so. Just give me one minute. I I will be. Uh, just give me one minute, please.
Seems like there is some sound noise, so we are trying to fix it. Just give us one minute. All right. So the CO2 concentration is optimal valence. So the reason for that is uh, in this uh, thermostat of our planet Earth. So what really happens is during volcanoes. There is a CO2, uh, the major source of CO2 to the atmosphere is uh, through volcanoes. So, you supply CO2, so you constantly put this CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, if you constantly putting the CO2 in the atmosphere, it should constantly pile up and you may lead up, lead to a very high CO2 concentration, that like that happens for other plants. But that is not the case for our planet. The reason is, this CO2 is actually consumed through a process called weathering. So, there are certain kind of minerals that exist in our continental crust, which are the silicate minerals, silicate minerals like the basalt rocks or the granites that you see around, they are the silicate rocks and these rocks have various uh, minerals which are rich in silica and these minerals if you start chemically eroding, then this CO2 will be consumed and I shall be talking how that influences CO2 concentration and because of this specific process you are actually uh, this volcanic supplied CO2 is counterbalanced and hence you reduce the CO2 concentration in our planet. Is this the only process which consumes the CO2? No, there are several various other processes like organic carbon barrier and is this is the only source of CO2? No, there are various other like the organic oxidation. If you put a leaf and you, after a certain time you see that they are like this in color, that means the CO2 got oxidized and got into the atmosphere. But those are some processes which we are not considering for today's discussion. Right, so before I get into the details of this linkage between mountain building, weathering and climate, I must talk about what is weathering and erosion. So weathering basically means that the breakdown of rocks at the surface of the earth. So if you have a rock, you can erode, you can weather them, weather them in various uh, ways, but if you see some of these pictures are what you see in a normal setting. So this is the breaking of a rock or some corrosion or some part of the cliff. There is a breaking of rocks through plants and there is a biological breaking. So these processes, this weathering or breakdown of rocks can happen in two ways. One is physical weathering, which means the rocks is hammered physically and got powder. And when you find fragmented rock, there is basically no change in chemistry. The chemistry of the rock and this fine fragment near or near uh, around are uh, very similar. When you talk of chemical weathering, what you do, you have a powder, you put some acids, there will be a certain fraction which will dissolve and get into rivers, becomes the nutrient ultimately, and there can be residue product. Residue product means they will form clays and they can alter them. So there are uh, any chemical weathering has you change the chemistry. Now erosion is transporting the weather product, the water, the dissolved product or the residue product and transport them and put them in the um, nearby oceans. So these weathering and erosion are interchangeably used but mostly weathering is breakdown of rocks either like physical or chemical whereas erosion is transport of those things from one place to another. Now this is what this uh, cartoon basically uh, replicates or shows how these uh, rocks are consumed in CO2. So if you see that the CO2 is there in the atmosphere or in the soil, the soil or atmospheric CO2 mixes with water and they form a acid, that acid is called carbonic acid. This carbonic acid, let's say you have a calcium carbonate rock here, when you put the uh, interact with calcium carbonate with this acid, they will actually dissolve and they will supply calcium and bicarbonate to the water. Okay. Now this calcium and bicarbonate from the river will be transported and they will reach to the ocean. In the ocean, after supersaturation or through biological uptake, these calcium and bicarbonate will go back and form calcium carbonate and during this process you release one mole of CO2. So one mole of CO2 was consumed, a calcium carbonate was dissolved, this calcium carbonate came back to the ocean basin 
with one mole of CO2 being supplied by it. So they are in balance. But if you see the chemical reaction facilitated like calcium carbonate, CO2 and water forming the carbonic acid, the river gives you calcium and bicarbonate, the calcium carbonate forming in the ocean and CO2 is supplied there. So they are in balance if it is a limestone, if it is a dolomite, then this CO2 will be uh, in balance. But if you talk of silicate minerals, I have given a very primary uh, composition which is the calcium silica and oxide. If you take, then they take actually two mole of CO2 and that two mole of CO2 is uh, used while as you supply them only one mole of CO2. So the silicate mineral, the conversion of silicate to carbonate actually serve as a, as a CO2 sink. And that is what is very important when you have a, that's why I call chemical weathering of silicate act as a major CO2 sink over geological time scales. So we'll take a one minute break again. There is a sound problem, we need to fix that. All right. So the, what we have been discussing till now is mountain building and uh, you know, the weathering, the river and processes and they linkage with the CO2. That's what we are trying to understand. Okay. So, this, the, I, I will just, because of the break, I will just take it through again. So, we discussed that the calcium carbonate, silicate rocks, two mole of CO2 consume and you found a calcium carbonate in the ocean. So, this two CO2 and one mole of CO2, because of that, the CO2 surface in a sink. Now, now, if you go back and see the Earth's climate in past, whether the CO2 was constant, whether there was a fluctuation, whether there is CO2 changes for the primary driver for uh, CO2 concentration on our planet uh, in the past. So, what I have shown here is a record of temperature, CO2 and sea level fluctuations in last 60 million years, okay, 60, 70 million years. During this period, if you see the trends, Basically, the temperature which was around 30 degrees centigrade, steady decline was there, so it is called as a global cooling that has happened for the last 60 million years. Okay? And this decline in temperature is also consistent with atmospheric CO2 what people have measured. Now, you should worry why these, are, how do we know that this temperature and CO2 concentration in past in millennia time scales we know. These, These are actually done through isotopic analysis of uh, certain sedimentary rocks, mostly uh, carbonate rocks. If you study the isotopes of some of these uh, sedimentary rocks or fossils, basically you should be able to compute the temperature and CO2 trends that occurred in the past. We can discuss that a in a separate lecture. But today, please uh, see this reconstruction that was compiled by Rai et al. in 2021. And they have shown that the global temperature of CO2 is declined by 30 became 15, around 15 degree decline of temperature happened. And similarly, if you see the CO2 concentration, which was around 1500, and we are talking of 400 here. So the basically, there is a thousand ppm of CO2 decline happened in the 60 millennia. Now, why, why these things happen? Why the cooling occurred? If we can understand this, probably we can use that today to bring down the temperature, the CO2 that is increasing constantly through anthropogenic processes. So, geologists wanted to understand why the global, what triggered the global cooling, what triggered the CO2 decline. Can we answer this? So, for that, there was a very beautiful study in 1992 by Remo and Redimon who saw that yes, there is a decline in the uh, temperature and this is what is called as a global cooling during the last century part of it and they believed this is maybe because of atmospheric CO2 decline and they coupled that with the Himalaya evolution. What is very interesting is the Himalaya which was not existing prior to 60 millennia this mountain actually started building up at around 55-60 millennia and the formation of Himalaya mountain, uh, this uh, the timing is very synchronous where the temperature started declining. 
So, so this uh, Himalaya formation probably have triggered intense silicate weathering because of its high elevation and the kind of rock that is existing in Himalaya. So these people suggested that yes, Himalaya may be the main factor because of Himalaya formation. You may have a very large amount of silicate uh, minerals exposed to the continent and their weathering, as I discussed, the silicate weathering this, uh, should have lead to CO2 consumption and because of CO2 consumption, the temperature might have fallen and hence you got into a global cooling. Now it was very interesting because the Himalaya may, may country account for only 2 to 3 percent of the global area. But still, people are talking of 10 degree, 15 degree changes in the temperatures just because of Himalaya started forming. Is it possible? Can we evaluate this hypothesis? Is there a way through which we can confirm or reject this hypothesis? So, our research works towards that erosion process in the Himalaya. We believe that these river systems are such, such a huge river systems, they can actually make an impact. So, uh, of, of course, course this is uh, obvious that for Ganga and Brahmaputra are two major river systems in the Himalaya. The headwaters drain through these basins in the Himalayas are actually go through high elevation, high relief and intense precipitation because um, unlike other global rivers, Indian rivers, particularly the Himalayan rivers, Actually, their weathering is more the intensity of these erosion processes in Himalaya can be higher because of high monsoon because they will give a lot of uh, uh, rainfall. So, runoff will be very high because runoff is very high with a high relief. You produce high stream powers and they can actually weather some of these rocks. So, if you actually count for how much sediment and dissolved load are forming. The, the Ganga, Ganga Brahmaputra probably will top the least of all the rivers that you see in the planet. So, so globally, these rivers rank first, particularly in sediment transport, means physical erosion wise, they are the first river, and fourth in water discharge. Now, what did we do? We basically, basically collect water samples. Across the first thing is we wanted to see the CO2 consumption potential of Himalayan rivers and compare with all the rivers, number one. And if it is indeed higher, the CO2 consumption potential is very high, that is number one. And number two is, can if it is high today, can that sustain for 60 millennia? That these are the two questions which we will try to understand. So for that, what we did is we collected a lot of river water samples across the Himalaya, we analyze them, the chemistry of these rivers, we analyze them using various equipment, mainly ion chromatograph and ICPMS. Then we did a calculation because river water, the solutes that you find in a river can come from multiple sources. So we wanted to compute, do a mass balance to calculate how much of these cations actually come from silicate because they are the only candidate who can consume CO2. If, if we know how much is coming from silicate, we can calculate the CO2 consumption potential and once that is known, can we compare that with the global ones. So, so these are the pictures of some of my students who participated in the field trips. So these are, uh, these are various river systems, this is one in the uh, Himalayas, uh, particularly in the Indus river system and we also go to various uh, ocean cruises to collect uh, sediments beneath the ocean so that we can go back in time. Some of these water samples are also collected here. Once these uh, samples, whether it is water or marine sediment or we collect some of the fossils from the uh, marine sediments and do a lot of chemical processing and their mass spectrometric analysis to bring all the uh, data that is required. So this is very experimental intensive. So sometime if you find time, please do visit to ISR Pune. Some of these facilities are available here. So we can describe you in detail what is uh, how this kind of researches or experiments are being done. Once you know that, so river water chemistry is obvious that it may come from certain elements like the sodium or chloride can come from atmosphere. There may be rocks that is dissolving, the chemical weathering of these rocks are important and also there are anthropogenic input and there are groundwater or springs that supplies to these things. What basically we need to do is, once we know the river water, 
we need to find out how much of rock weathering is responsible for this chemistry and from the rock weathering we need to find out how much silicate is done. So there are a forward model or inverse model that we do to simply tell you the major constituents that you find in liver are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. In case of ions, you measure chloride, bicarbonate, sulfate, nitrate, these are uh, with the silicic acid also found in the river water. But these, uh, these elements are very peculiar of certain sources like chloride. Chloride only comes from rainwater. Mostly they come from rainwater or they come from uh, anthropogenic sources and when they come from these two sources, they are mostly sodium chloride kind of thing. So those kind of understanding we do use because we know chloride can come from rain or anthropogenic things. Similarly, sodium can come from rain, anthropogenic, but additionally it can come from silicates. So, so we can compute how much of silicate is coming. So I can give you one example. So even we can make mass balance uh, calculations of calcium by sodium river will be equal to if there are three sources, let's say they are coming from rain, silicate, carbonate, anthropogenic. You can write some equations like this and solve them to find how much is coming. I'll give you a simple example. How do we do that? Let's say I went to a field, collected one river water. And, and I measured the sodium, calcium, magnesium, chloride and, and let's say chloride I found it to be 20 micromolar, sodium I found it to be 100 micromolar, calcium I found 400 micromolar, let's say magnesium I found 200 micromolar. So chloride I know they come only through rain because I am not considering anthropogenic, I am assuming a pristine water here. So if it is a pristine water, so this is a Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just, just take, take one, one, one minute break because there are some technical issues there. Just, just give me one minute please. please. Alright, <coughs> so, so, so what, what I am trying, trying to say is, let's say if you caught a pristine water, can you find out how much is coming from, from silicates? Now, now for, for that, that you have to rely on certain elements which is index uh, elements, uh, elements like, like chloride. Chloride, chloride is specifically comes from rain, rain. They, they, they are, are not available in any rock types. types. So, so if you, you know, know the sodium, sodium uh, chloride content for rain, let's say typically it is 20 micromolar. Because, because they are, they are not, not there in any rock type, type they, they will be zero, zero for other things, things right? right? So, so now, now if it is 20, how much of that, that will be in the sodium, sodium part, part of it? it. So, so the, the sodium, sodium will be, because, because this, this is, is a 20, 20 uh, uh, chloride is 20, so, so sodium, sodium has to be 20, 20 from rain. Whereas, whereas in case of carbonate, sodium is monovalent, it does not fit with the lattice of Carbonates, it mainly takes a divalent, which are calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate kind of uh, constituent. So, the remaining part of sodium has to be from silicate. So, if it is 20, then 80 micromolar is uh, sodium. Similar calculations, uh, if, you, if you want to know how much calcium is coming from this 400, so if you know the calcium by sodium of silicate rock and multiply that with this number, you will get how much calcium silicate is there, how much. So, this 0.7 is calcium by sodium in silicate. This is magnesium by sodium in silicate. So, sodium, sodium cancels out. So, you find the magnesium silicate. So, you can sum them out so to find what is the total amount of uh, cations that is coming from silicate. In this particular case, it comes under 160 micromolar per liter. Now, it is uh, 160 micromolar per liter. So, so if you, you know, know how much liter per watt year 
the river is supplying, then you just multiply to find how much more per year is happening. So I have done that for all the uh, global rivers like the Ganga, Brahmaputra, Indus river system, the blue colors are the Ganga, Brahmaputra, Indus and I have compared that with the global average. This green color is the average for all the global rivers. What you see here is very striking different strikingly different erosion rates for Himalayan rivers and when compared to the global rivers. So typically the Himalayan rivers, the CO2 consumption rates are in the tune of 4 into 10 to the 5, um, into 10 to the 5 moles per kilometer square per year, whereas for global river it is about 1. So this means 3 to 4 times higher erosion rate is happening in the Himalayas. 3 to 4 times of higher intense silicate weathering is happening in Himalaya. If intense silicate weathering is happening in Himalaya, the CO2 consumption potential of these rivers are higher. So yes, there is a possibility present at least that the CO2 consumed, consumed during Himalaya processes by silicate weathering can be a major sink of CO2 at a global scale. But can this sustain for 60 million years? Do we have a... Uh, is there a way through which we can check it? So for that, we rely on a proxy called strontium isotopes, right? So the strontium isotope, uh, I'll, not got, uh, I'll, I'll not discuss in much detail why the strontium is a proxy for silicate weathering. But what I want you to emphasize here is 87 strontium is a radiogenic isotope. It's a uh, 87 rubidium which is radioactive. It decays to 87 strontium. So, this 87 strontium is a radiogenic isotope, means produced through radioactivity, whereas 86 strontium, means strontium has different isotopes, it has four isotopes. We are talking of two isotopes. One of them is produced through radioactivity, which is 87 strontium. The other one is 86 strontium, which is a stable isotope. So, they ratio because rubidium is a 1A element, it is very chemically very similar like potassium, whereas strontium which is a 2A element in the periodic table and it is more like a calcium. So this potassium by calcium ratio decides and time factor decides what should be the 87 strontium by 86 strontium for any river system. There are various uh, people who have studied this uh, proxy in detail and they see that this may serve as a proxy to talk in terms of silicate versus carbonate weathering. In a particular basin, if there is a high silicate weathering is happening, the 87 by 86 transfer should be high. If uh, in a particular basin the uh, carbonate weathering is dominating, this particular ratio should be low. So, so, if you, you compile all the 87 strontium by 86 strontium for global rivers, so they are, are very low. Okay, okay this cons cons uh, the isotope ratios are very low compared to the Ganga Brahmaputra rivers, particularly the Himalayan rivers. If you see, they are strikingly different. So, they, these numbers can be measured up to sixth place. You know, PPM level precision we can go. So that means 0 0.70710250 kind of a precision we can achieve through our mass spectrometric analysis. So in that precision also, this uh, world river is about 0 0.715, 0 0.71, whereas the Himalayan rivers it is around 0 0.7, 0 0.78. That scale of large. So because it is distinctly different for Himalaya, if Himalaya weathering is higher then it must be archived in the past records. Can we see that? Can, do we see a similar growth in strontium isotope? Do the strontium isotope trends also show that it is very high in the Himalayas? So this is a sea water strontium isotope curve that people have measured. Remember it is a global number, it is not a regional scale and it also show that the strontium isotope are constantly increasing from around 40 millennia. If you consider the residence time and make a mass balance and if you because we know strontium isotopes are much much higher compared to the Himalayan rivers. So this steady growth of uh, seawater strontium curve also confirms that at a chemical level 
Himalayan rivers were very very crucial in supplying this radiogenic strontiums. So they are very high, and hence it confirms the continental the weathering of uh, Himalayas was much higher. So the last two pictures actually confirms yes this one confirms yes present day himalaya erosion rates are much much higher than the other rivers so they have a high co2 potential and this curve confirms that the himalaya weathering have influenced the global chemical and climate cycles for a large period of time and it may have a smaller area but it is very important and hence it consumed CO2 and hence it declined the temperature quite a bit. In fact, the record shows it is around 10 to 15 degree. So, I gave you an example where the continental weathering or increase in weathering process through tectonism or mountain building process triggered high weathering in the continent because high weathering happened the CO2 consumed and hence we got into a global cooling. So there is a tectonics, weathering and climate linkage. So that is what we understood from the story of Himalaya formation. But can we use this understanding for present day problem? The present day problem is the CO2 is increasing. It is increasing like anything. So it in a pre-industrial area it was uh, era it was around 250 ppm but now it is around it is touching beyond 400 ppm so in last 50 or 60 million years we have increased this sorry 50 to 60 years we have increased this uh, concentrations from around uh, 100 ppm can our understanding of silicate weathering and co2 be implemented and do some geoengineering to address this problem is there a possibility the answer is yes so if you see the different silicate rocks that is available on earth surface so if you see the different kind of rocks that is available in the earth surface you of course see limestone you see dolomite but at the same time you also see granites basalts gabbros rhyolites these kind of silicate rocks also you find and they have different minerals so if you see the minerals so they these minerals are olivin pyroxene you know feldspar pezioclase quartz so they 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 are composed of the rock is composed of several minerals they have different kind of minerals and they have crystal crystallized at different temperature but if you put them in the continent the higher uh, the temperature the minerals which crystallize at a higher temperature are very unstable at a lower temperature the present surface uh, surface temperature they are not that stable compared to the quartz so because olivin pyroxene amphibole these are at a very high temperature they can relative weather faster so we are not talking of carbonates because they don't play a role in the co2 cycle but if you can bring some of these uh, fastly eroding minerals and use them for uh, dissolution then they they can consume co2 and they can solve or counterbalance some of these uh, atmospheric uh, thing okay so there is a there is huge amount of uh, if you see the our own indian uh, map so you see there are huge amount of rivers they are very large scale river systems and they uh, i always believe that the rivers act like a you know uh, blood veins in a body uh, what it does is actually it takes atmosphere it erodes the geological components and supply these things to the ocean so atmosphere geosphere biosphere and hydrosphere it all are coupled through these rivers and if you see the river flowing terrains if you see the terrains so this is a geological map of uh, India. So these are the in the western part of uh, India near around Pune. You see Deccan basalts, okay, and you the pink colors that you see here are also silicate rocks. So around around seventy percent of our uh, uh, map, our land is actually rich in silicate uh, minerals. So somehow if we can fasten the erosion processes in these uh, uh, basins 
then actually we can consume CO2 and it can this consumption can reduce the atmospheric CO2. So a uh, lot of scientists have started working towards it and see if it is feasible. So what they have done is they have called they have initiated a program which is called enhanced weathering for carbon sequestration. So what is this enhanced weathering means naturally there is a weathering happening silicate minerals are there there is a weathering happening on a millennia time scale we know they are making an impact the temperature is reducing the CO2 concentration is reducing. So this process if can be fastened can be enhanced some way then they can quickly sequesters the CO2. So for that what they are doing is the powder silicates in croplands they put uh, uh, this this is a agriculture land they have powdered the some of the fast dissolving minerals you cannot powder and put all sort of mineral to fasten this to enhance the weathering process you need to put these minerals or these rock types which is very easy to dissolve which have a faster dissolution kinetics so for that they took certain uh, basaltic uh, rocks and powdered them because if you powder them there will be a high surface area so the rock inter rock water interaction possibility is much larger so if you have a larger surface area then the weathering can be very fast so what they do is they powder these fresh basalt rocks and they put it in croplands so once you put them in cropland uh, croplands and you do your agriculture practices more weathering will happen because they are easily dissolvable as we know from the thermodynamics or their dissolution kinetics easily they will start dissolving more weathering means more alkaline is produced more alkaline is produced means the carbon which was lying in the atmosphere or the soil co2 now it became water alkaline so the carbon actually came to the water phase so the atmospheric carbon got into the hydrosphere and it stays for 100,000 years. So because we are talking of a sudden reduction in the temperature, you need to transform this atmospheric CO2 and put them in a hydrosphere. So alkalinity wise this concentration have increased. Once that is happening, it is an efficient way of carbon sequestration because they can dissolve faster, you have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and soil, they will interact, produce the carbonic acid. So you will sequester the carbon and they will make alkalinity or if they precipitate in some ocean basins, they will forming as a calcium carbonate and they will stay there for millennia. And this is so, it is a very, very efficient way of carbon sequestration. Because they have good amount of uh, these uh, required nutrient, the composition of these basaltic rock is such that they can give you good uh, nutrient supply or soil fertility. And in addition to that, what the basalts does is because we are in the in the western part of it, we have a huge exposed occurrence of these basaltic rocks actually. So we are located in a right place to powder them and put them in agriculture probably we are doing it naturally because what you see in the western part of India and these uh, lands that is observed we are doing this process probably regularly we need to make a budgeting we need to calculate that whether we are consuming CO2 more than any other places in the globe. So, but the concern remains is some of these processes it is not that it is very straightforward and we can do it and implement it straight away there is a problem associated with that the problem is these basalt rocks are composed of certain elements which can which may not which may not be good to find in water system like some of the toxic elements like chromium nickel these are very high in these basalt rocks and if you start eroding them probably they get into the water uh, hydrospheres uh, the ground water or the river water and if people start using that for drinking purposes we need to make sure before we implement this that these toxic elements are not influencing our health so that is the only concern that people need to understand uh, we need to remove around we will be able to remove uh, what is the projection is we need to remove 125 billion tons of CO2 by 2100 versus 12,000 billion tons storage in US and Europe alone and if you add India and China we should be so this is already 125 became uh, 12, 
thousand potential is there if you add india and china which was not assessed yet people have not quantified it we should be able to reach it through this enhanced weathering processes so this is the process which has a huge potential but lot of research has to be done so that it can be directly taken forward all right i'll summarize what is uh, what we discussed today is river plays a key role in regulating the global climate and oceanic budget so they are the prime controller of climatic and uh, oceanic cycles and river which means the erosion process the chemical weathering of silicate minerals as we discussed act as a major sink for co2 atmospheric co2 if you are talking of why our planet has a low co2 but not in other systems then basically what you do is the uh, chemical weathering of silicate minerals they are the major sink and they the atmosphere the volcanic co2 which was put in the atmosphere they can be consumed through some of these processes we also saw that the intense weathering over the himalaya since the formation of this uh, young orogenic belt himalaya it, it initiated huge amount of silicate weathering once the silicate weathering was very high it started uh, consuming co2 and hence we lead to a we, we got into a global cooling uh, event during cenozoic and based on all the geological understanding now we know that enhanced silicate weathering can be uh, efficiently used for carbon sequestration so if we start putting this powder basalts in agricultural lands we can have uh, we can consume co2 quite uh, efficiently and that can serve as our problem solving for uh, how to reduce the co2 in the atmosphere thank you and i'll happy to answer any questions so if you have uh, uh, if you have any questions related to this uh, presentation please ask in chat thank you okay uh, till you write your questions in chat box i'll just uh, summarize in hindi what we discuss aaj humne baat jo kiya wo basically is uh, mudde pe tha ki jo mountain formation hota hai jo parbat bante hain jaise himalaya bana hai ye 50 million year pehle bana hai aur us samay mein wahan par jo rock type milte hain ek jaise ki silicate rocks milte hain वो उसका डिजोल्यूशन के लिए हमें एटमोस्फेरिक सी या सॉइल सी के साथ पानी को मिला के कार्बोनिक एसिड बनाना होता है और जो सिलिकेट रॉक्स को कार्बोनिक एसिड के साथ आप डालेंगे तो जो डिजोल्व कंस्टिट्यूएंट बनते हैं जैसे कि कैल्शियम और बाइकार्बोनेट बनते हैं और वो समंदर में जाके कैल्शियम कार्बोनेट बनाते हैं ये जो प्रोसेस है सिलिकेट रॉक को कार्बोनेट रॉक में कन्वर्जन कर लिया गया उसी दौरान सी कंज्यूम हो जाता है सीओ टू घट जाता है एटमोस्फेयरिक का तो माउंटेन जो बना हिमालय जो बना उससे सीओ टू काफ़ी मात्रा में घट जाती है अब सीओ टू घट गई जो कि ग्रीन हाउस गैस है तो टेम्परेचर भी घट जाती है तो हमारी ग्लोबल क्लाइमेट में भी कूलिंग की तरफ हम शिफ्ट हो जाते हैं तो जो टेक्टोनिक्स है जैसे कि आपने माउंटेन बनाया और वेदरिंग है जैसे कि आपने रॉक को डिजोल्व किए और जो क्लाइमेट है जैसे कि आप सी कंज्यूम किए तो टेम्परेचर घट गया इन तीनों को कपलिंग को आज हमने स्टडी किया और ये बताया कि इसी कारण से हमारा सी ओ टू जो है वो काफ़ी मात्रा में कम है एक ट्रेस अमाउंट में है जबकि हमारे नेबरिंग प्लानट्स में ये एक मेजर कंस्टिट्यूएंट है तो यही डिस्कशन हमारा आज था कि ये जो वेदरिंग प्रोसेस है काफ़ी एफिशिएंट प्रोसेस है सी ओ टू कंज्यूम करने की तो आज की डेट में हम अगर इस टाइप की रॉक को पाउडर करके एग्लिकेचर लैंड में डाल लें तो हो सकता है कि जो हमारा सी ओ टू की प्रॉब्लम है जो ग्लोबल वार्मिंग की प्रॉब्लम है उसको भी काफ़ी मात्रा में हम घटा पाए ऑल राइट सो थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर अटेंडिंग दिस टॉक सो आवर नेक्स्ट टॉक इज इन जनवरी प्लीज डू ज्वाइन अस इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस यू कैन स्टेट अ वे राइट ई मेल टू आवर साइंस एक्टिविटी सेंटर और इवन कमेंट इन दी यूट्यूब यू विल गेट बैक टू यू थैंक यू वेरी मच Good day